tonight is called Seven Potent Proofs for a Pre-Trib Rapture. Now, I want to start out by saying that a lot of times people get a little bit discouraged about prophecy because they think, what, does it matter where we locate the rapture? Who, who cares if it's before the tribulation, the middle of the tribulation, three quarters of the way through or after? Well, to be honest, if it was simply a matter of putting a point on a timeline, it wouldn't matter that much. I mean, it's been given unto the church to suffer tribulation, right? So how, does it matter if we suffered seven more years of tribulation? And if that's all the only issue that was involved in it, it it's not that important. However, that's not the only issue that's involved in it. If you don't understand that God has one plan for Israel and another plan for the church, and that he's got to finish the church program before he goes back and picks up and finishes what he started with Israel, you can't really understand the prophetic message of the New Testament. Now tonight I'm going to walk you through seven arguments, seven distinct arguments for a pre-tribulation rapture. I'm just going to go at an introductory level. I'm not going to go real deep on these points. I just want to make the points. And I'm also going to let you know that these slides are available or will be available on my website. And I'm going to uh, pass them over to Greg so that they'll be available on his conference website too. So let's get started. For those of you who don't know who I am, I am Lee Brainerd. I'm a researcher and a prophecy teacher from Harvey, North Dakota. Now, when you come into the pre-trib rapture argument here, there's some people that will say, oh, there's no evidence in the New Testament for, for a pre-trib rapture. There isn't a single verse that teaches it. And I kind of find myself scratching my head when I hear this argument. Because when people debate, the debate does not go to the person with the best arguments. Who wins a debate 99% of the time? The person that can speak with the biggest, loudest mouth. The person who can hammer and rail and bash, that's who wins the debate. It's the strongest personality that wins the debate. This is why error runs the table on the truth over and over again. And it's why only those who go to the scriptures and study the scriptures with the Berean spirit. Those are the ones who don't get deceived. So, there's seven arguments that we're going to run through tonight. The first one is the Bible holds out a distinct future for Israel. The second one is the Bible clearly teaches that the 70th week is for Israel. The third one is that the Bible clearly promises that the church will be delivered from the time of tribulation. The fourth one is that when we look at passages that have saints in the tribulation, they're always Jewish law-keeping saints. Doing the temple service, for instance. The fifth one is that when we look at Revelation chapters 4 and 5, we see the church in heaven already prior to the opening of the first seal in chapter 6. The sixth one is that we have some very clear typologies of a pre-tribulation rapture in the Bible. And the last one is that when we look at the passages that talk about relative normality, when the day of the Lord comes, that relative normality only fits a pre-tribulation rapture. It does not fit the second coming at the end. So proof number one, the Bible holds out a distinct future for national Israel. I love this. Out of Romans chapter 11, verses 28 and 29. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. I want you to think about this. We all use the gifts and calling of God are without repentance, and we apply it all over the map, and that's okay. We should. This principle is true. But if you notice here, when God trots this line out in the Bible, what's it associated with? It's associated with the fact that he said, hey, I made promises to Israel in the Old Testament. I am a God who keeps my promises, and I am going to keep every single promise I made to the people and nation of Israel. My gifts and my calling are without repentance. 
And I want you to take this to heart too for your own practical application to yourself. Some of you can look at yourself and you, and you see someone who stumbled many times, someone who spent years wallowing in the muck and the mire. And you wonder if you're fit for heaven. Well, guess what? You're not. None of us are. Surprise, right? We are fit for heaven for one reason. One reason. And that reason is the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the altar in heaven. That's it. Now, God's got a plan for Israel. Can you imagine how excited he is? He loves what he's doing at the church age. He loves what his son is doing at the church age. And he can hardly wait to finish the church age so that Jesus can have his bride. But then he's going to go deal with Israel. He's been waiting 2,000 years to go back to dealing with Israel. 2,000 years. And it says in Romans chapter 11, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure, riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For if the casting away was a reconciling of the world, what shall the reception be but life from the dead? Let me paraphrase this passage for you. You thought we did something amazing when I started the church and we poured out the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and we saw a massive revival that spread through the whole world? You thought that was awesome? Wait till you see what I do when I return to Israel in the tribulation. You know, we're in the tribulation, there's going to be the greatest apostasy in the history of the world. It's going to get darker and fouler than it's ever been on this planet. But at the same time, amongst the remnant, there's going to be the greatest revival on the history of the planet. In, in Zechariah 13, it tells us that one-third of the Jews are going to be delivered and saved. There's never been a revival where one-third of a people or one-third of a nation was saved. This is going to be the most amazing hour. And I'm going to be glued to the big screen TV in glory every night watching this go on, drinking my heaven bucks coffee. <laughs> Israel has a future. In Acts chapter 15, verses 14 through 16, we read, Simon has declared how God first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. This is the church. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written, after this I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down and will build again its ruins and I will set it up. When God gets done with the church age, he is going back to pick up where he left off with Israel. And they're going to get their land promises, their temple promises, their throne promises, the, the Davidic promises covenant promises they're going to get the whole nine yards but they don't get them through the law the lord is not going back to the law folks in the 70th week he's going back to people that are under the law nobody's ever been saved by the law nobody can be saved by the law and those people that are under the law those jewish people they need the gospel of the lord jesus christ they can only inherit the their promises in the old testament through the blood of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. That's it. Hosea chapter 3 says, For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king or a prince, without a sacrifice or a sacred pillar, without ephod or teraphim. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They get both. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. By the way, just a little rabbit trail here. Some people get confused by verse 4. It says, without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or teraphim. This is without a king, the way God designed. This is without a prince following the ways of the world. This is without a sacrifice, the way God designed. This is without sacred pillars according to pagan religion. This is without God's ephod for discerning the will of God. And this is without teraphim, the false ways for discerning the will of God. This is a prophecy that Israel is going to be godless and atheistic. Anyways, let's move on. Amos 9, I will sift the house of Israel among all nations as grain is sifted in a sieve. 
All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, who say the calamity shall not overtake us. On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David. And this takes us right back to Acts chapter 15. So if you have an after this, this means the church age comes to an end. And then you have a return to Israel, and that's Israel going into the tribulation. This is a pre-tribulation rapture before God goes to the nation of Israel. Now, the second proof is the 70th week is plainly stated to be for Israel. Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 here. Seventy weeks are determined upon your people and upon your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy, that is the holy temple. Seventy weeks. Now we read in the rest of this chapter that after the 69 weeks, the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, was cut off, but not for himself. And then there's a little hiatus, and then the people of the prince that shall come, not the true prince in heaven, but the false prince, the Antichrist, the people that come, which is the Romans, will destroy Jerusalem. It happened in 70 AD. We've already got a window here, and this window just gets longer and longer because we're not into the 70th week yet. There's the first 69 weeks were done by the time of the cross. That 70th week is still future. It's still coming. God split those two pieces of time and drop the church age in between them because Israel was not ready for her Messiah. So the Lord says, I'm going to take that gospel. I'm going to give it to the Gentile world. I'm going to let them run with it. And when I'm done with them, we're going to go back to Israel. This is the God of second chances. The God of second chances. Can you imagine? Here is a people who slew all the Lord's prophets. And when he sent his son, they slew the son. Who perverted his religion. Who lived in rebellion. Who were as wicked as the pagan nations around them. And they snubbed God over and over and over again. And he is going to go back and give them another chance. This is an amazing God we serve. He's glorious he, in his mercy. He's glorious in his grace. He's glorious in his love. And he's going to win. The devil is not going to win this one. Amen. Jeremiah 37, alas, for that day is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. This 70th week, this tribulation is designed for Israel. Now, Gentiles around the world are going to be saved. But the primary purpose at this time is to restore the nation of Israel to be what they were supposed to be in the first place, which is a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. And they wouldn't do their job. So now the church is a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. But he's going back. He's going back. The tribulation is upon Israel. If we have these clear statements in Scripture that the tribulation is upon the nation of Israel, then the church program cannot be continuing. God cannot have two distinct peoples on earth at the same time. He can't have two distinct temples at the same time. Before he went to the spiritual temple, which is the church, he rent the veil in the physical temple, and he set that physical temple aside. Before he goes back to that physical temple, he has to remove the testimony of the spiritual temple. He's going to take them up to glory, and then he's going to go back. And he's going to deal with Israel again. Proof number three, it's Israel in the tribulation not Christians. Now, a lot of people, I was this way when I was a young believer. I just read through the Bible. I see in Matthew 24, there's believers going through the tribulation. I said, aha, see, there's, the church is going to go through the tribulation. And older and wiser brothers would say, well, hold on. What does the context say? Well, let's look at this context. When you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, this is the temple. Then let those who live in Judea, 
Flee to the mountains. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world, even until this time, no, nor ever shall be. Now notice, it's the holy place. This isn't St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. This isn't the Lutheran church down the street. It's not a Baptist church. This is the temple in Jerusalem. When it says, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, this is not an exhortation for those that live in Montana and Oklahoma and North Dakota to go flee to the mountains. It's an exhortation for those that live in the land of Israel to flee to the mountains. Now, maybe other people are going to find need to flee too, but at this particular day, this happens in Jerusalem, in the temple, and it's the people that live in Judea that are told to flee. Now, we also, in this same passage, I didn't touch on it, but in Matthew 24, it also talks about the Sabbath, and God upholds the Sabbath over the Jewish people. He says, pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath. The believers are dead to the law and married to another which is the new covenant in Jesus Christ's blood. Now here in Revelation chapter 11, then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar and those who worship there. But leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. Now notice, we're in the tribulation, and God's measuring the temple, the physical precinct of the temple. He's measuring the altar and he's measuring those who worship there. I don't know how to get around this. This is God taking ownership of not only the Jewish religion during the 70th week, the outward religion, but those that practice it. He's owning them. This doesn't mean they're going to be saved just because they're keeping the Jewish law. There's no such thing. But this does mean that during the 70th week, the formal outward religion that God has given to the people of God is not Christianity like we practice in this age. He's given them a formal outward religion, which is Judaism, the Mosaic law. And believers are going to be obligated to walk in those paths to the best of their ability and the best of their knowledge. But they still have to be born again. You know, we're not saved in this age by partaking the Lord's table and getting baptized. That doesn't save us. And them doing their sacrifices again is not going to save them. It's faith in Jesus Christ. We also read, now I love this, this aspect here about the 70th week. I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. If anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. If anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. They have the power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. They have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all kinds of plagues as often as they desire. Now, let me ask you something. Does this jive with the church age? Does this harmonize with the church age? Absolutely not. And this is what Luke presents in chapter 9 in his gospel. Starting in verse 52, they entered a village of the Samaritans. And they saw that the Samaritans did not receive them. When James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and consume them like Elijah did? He turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Now, I want you to pick up on what's going on here. He's not saying, oh, I thought you guys were saved. I think I'm changing my mind. No, what he's saying is, you guys are still in the Old Testament. How long does it take you to figure out I'm moving you into a new program? We're going in the church direction. We're not going to do things like we used to do. We're going to do them differently. We're going to bring a message of love rather than a message of law. And this is very simple to understand what's going on here. When we see Moses and Elijah, who, that's who I think the two witnesses are, calling down fire from heaven and bringing judgments upon the earth, this is a testimony that we've gone back to the 70th week that's going to be Jewish and Mosaic. It's not the church age. Proof number four. 
the church is promised deliverance from the tribulation. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Now, if you have a passage where it just states something generic, like delivers from the wrath to come, it doesn't specifically mention wailing and gnashing of teeth in the lake of fire, doesn't specifically mention things like outer darkness. The passage is talking about temporal judgment come down here upon earth at the end of this age. It's not talking about eternal punishment in the lake of fire. So we have a clear promise here. We are waiting for Jesus. We're waiting for that trumpet call. We're waiting for that shout. It cannot come fast enough as far as I'm concerned. But he is going to deliver us from the wrath to come, the judgment that's coming upon this age and this world in the near future. Revelation 3.10, this is my favorite pre-tribulation rapture passage. Because you have kept the matter of my patience, the King James says, because you've kept the word of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now, I want you to think about what this is saying. It says, keep you from the hour of trial. Folks, it does not say keep you through the hour of trial. If God wanted to say that, it was very easy to say, but he didn't say that. He said, keep you from the hour. Now notice that this hour also comes upon the entire globe. If it was only upon Asia and Europe and Africa, you just have to flee to South America or North America. If it was only on North America, we could flee to South America. It's on the whole globe. There's nowhere to go. You have to be removed from the globe to be removed from the hour. This is very simple math. As long as we just actually walk logically, this, this isn't physics. This is just 2 plus 2 and 6 minus 2. This is very easy. My paraphrase of Revelation 3.10 says this. Because you have patiently suffered with me in the time of my patience, which is the church age, I will remove you from this planet prior to the time of trial I am bringing upon the entire planet. John 14. This is a glorious passage. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Where was he going at that moment? Was he going somewhere else on planet Earth? No, he was going to the New Jerusalem. And that means where he's preparing a place for each of us in the New Jerusalem. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, that's New Jerusalem, you may be there with me. This passage tells us that the very next time the Lord Jesus physically interacts with the church, he's going to meet them and take them to glory. Take them to the New Jerusalem. We're going to spend seven years there plus a short window who we don't know how long it is. We don't know if that window's three weeks, three months, or three years. We have no idea. We might have our guesses, but we don't know. We're going to be up there for a while. Training to reign. Being prepared and ready for all the wedding stuff that we're going to do in heaven and then have the wedding supper for the whole world at the second coming. Proof number five. The church is seen in heaven in Revelation 4 and 5. I just love this passage. You know, you read these commentaries by these real learned scholars, and they are all over the map on the identity of the 24 elders. And you can read three or four pages of this gobbledygook and come away more confused than you were when you went to open the first page. It shouldn't be this way. There are times, folks, if you just trust the plain statements of Scripture, you will be wiser on the subject than men with a Ph.D. coming out of each ear. Revelation 4 forces around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. Now, these cannot be angels. Because we read in Revelation 5, 9, that they, 
re redeemed to God by the blood. They have to be human beings. We also read here that they're sitting on thrones. This is not chairs. This is thrones. That means they receive their reward. They're wearing their Stephanos crowns. That's the reward crown. This means they've been rewarded. When do we get rewarded? We get rewarded at the time of the rapture and the resurrection. That's when we receive our Stephanos crowns that we're going to cast at the Lord's feet. That's when we receive our thrones, whether we're going to rule over one city or two cities or five cities or ten cities. Maybe some people will rule over a whole state or a whole country. But that's when we receive this. Well, then who are this, these 24 elders? I believe that they're the heads of the 24 courses of the New Testament royal priesthood. Just like we see in, uh, in the Old Testament, in the book of Chronicles, where David appointed 24 priests, or 24 courses of priests. Why did he appoint 24 courses? Because everything he did was patterned after the temple in heaven. If he had 24 courses of priests, that means there's 24 courses in heaven. You break this down, every believer is going to be in one of these 24 courses. Every believer. Four times a year, all the courses will be gathered in New Jerusalem for worship. And two times a year, your course will be in New Jerusalem worshiping the Lord. He'll have 24-7 worship around his throne, but we will be busy doing things most of the year. But we will always be in regular worship of the Lord. Proof number six, there are some amazing typologies of a pre-tribulation rapture in the Bible. In Enoch, uh, I find my favorite typology, or one of them anyway. Genesis 5, 24, Enoch walked with God. And he was not for God took him. Now, Enoch went up before the flood. Enoch is a picture of the Gentile dominated church going up before the judgment comes. And when you come to Noah going through the flood in the ark, this is a great picture too. Because you can use this picture for both the picture of the church in the heavenly ark escaping the tribulation, but it also very well fits the Jews going through the tribulation. It's amazing to me that the Lord would present a typology like Noah that would fit both. But Enoch is only a picture of the church being delivered prior to to the coming of the judgment. Now, some people say, well, wait a minute. How can Enoch be a typology of the rapture before the judgment when Enoch was hundreds of years before the flood? And are you going to be raptured a hundred years before the flood? This is a mistake in understanding typology. Typology is based on the Bible's presentation of the situation and not based on the actual facts of history. For instance, when we come to um, uh, when Abraham uh, came to meet Melchizedek and they had their little meeting and we read about Melchizedek that he had fa neither father nor mother nor genealogy. This isn't telling us that this was an interesting man that, that didn't actually have parents. It's telling us that the Bible didn't present his genealogy and his parenthood. Because Jesus can't be both a type and the reality. So if Melchizedek is a type of Christ, he can't be Christ himself. And what's interesting about this is Melchizedek is obviously a type of the New Testament priesthood in glory. And it, the typology is in the Bible's presentation of the of the situation, not in the actual facts of history. Now here's another really amazing typology of the rapture. It's in John chapter 6. I'm just going to skip through the passage here. When evening was come, his disciples entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it became dark. And Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose because a strong wind blew. And they saw Jesus walking on the sea and nearing the ship. They received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at land whither they went. 
Can you imagine what was going through their minds? These guys get in the boat. They're going to sail across this sea. They've sailed across it many times. And a big storm caught them by surprise. A storm so big that they were scared. And then the Lord appears to them. And they're scared when they see him until they recognize that it's Jesus. And then as soon as he steps into the ship, that ship was at shore. This is a picture of the rapture. The church is going to be sailing across the sea of life. And before we reach the shore on the other side, a big storm is going to raise up. I think we have a storm coming here in America. It's coming, folks. And in the midst of this storm, when people start getting shaken and fearful, the Lord Jesus is going to appear to us. And as soon as he appears to us, we're out of here. We're going to glory. I can hardly wait. So we have these glorious typologies. Now, the last one I want to present is the days of Noah in relative normality. We read in Matthew 24, verses 36 to 39, but of that day and hour, no man knows. No, not the angels of heaven, but only my father. But as the days of Noah were, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, men were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and they were oblivious of impending judgment, until the flood came and took them away, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, we're looking at a situation here where the wheels of life in the world are still turning. They're turn in the Middle East, they're still turning the way they've been turning. In, in Europe, they're turning the way they've been turning. In America, they're turning the way they've been turning. Doesn't mean there's not hardships, but the hardships are not such that they stop the normal cycle of life from going on. And this is why when you try and look at how this passage fits with the one that we just read, I, I think that Mondo's got an amazing insight, and I think he's correct. We're, he... He says he doesn't believe when he looks at these two classes of passages that we're going to see physical persecution where we're literally getting beaten and dragged into FEMA camps or, or, or dragged into prison camps. We're not going to see it typically to that degree. We're going to see more social persecution. Some people may see some jail time. But it's going to be persecution through the laws. It's going to be trying to close down the churches, taking away the freedoms that we've enjoyed, and trying to shut down the testimony of Jesus and the testimony of the gospel. We're going to see the social level of persecution come like we have never seen it before. But here in this passage, people are still eating and drinking. We're still able to go to the supermarket. We're still able to go to the restaurant. We're still marrying and giving in marriage. Now, this situation here, it fits a pre-tribulation rapture. It does not fit the second coming. The, you're not going to have the normality of life going on at the second coming. At the second coming, the world's in a panic. You've got some people trying to hide themselves from the coming of the Lord. And people are trying to get rid of their gold and silver. And you've got people being whole armies moving over to Armageddon to meet the Lord in battle. Uh, you know, to me... How in the world does anyone think that they can defeat the Lord Jesus Christ when he descends from heaven? This is mass psychosis. But anyway, this can't be the second coming. The whole world at that time knows the Lord's coming, and they bring their armies to the right place at the right time to meet him. But here, they're caught by surprise. So... What I like to tell people is, picture the day of the Lord. It's, the day of the Lord's not a static point. The day of the Lord, it starts with the morning star of the day of the Lord. The morning star is the rapture of the church. That's the first sign that judgment's coming on the world. The tribulation is the dawning of that day. It's just going to get lighter and lighter and lighter. There's going to be more judgment on the world. The second coming, according to Malachi 4, is the sunrise of the day of the Lord. And the millennium is that day here on earth for a thousand years where the Lord rules with the rod of iron and his will shall be done on earth as it is in heaven. So this passage here, this relative normality, it fits the rapture of the church. It does not fit the second coming. 
So when you start looking at passages like this, it becomes crystal clear, becomes obvious that the Lord is going to take his church out of the world. And you know what? Some people say, oh, it doesn't really matter that much. Folks, the interpretation of 50% of the Bible is at stake here. If the Bible says God's going to go back to dealing with Israel in the 70th week, this, this, in, this is a whole bunch of the scripture because if God's going to go back to dealing with Israel in the 70th week, we're not just looking at the passages that mention the 70th week. We're looking at every passage in the Bible that touches on the promises made to the people and nation of Israel. The promises of scattering, the promises of trying them in, a, in the furnace, and the promises of gathering them back, and the promises of giving them all their promises. So this is really a substantial portion of understanding the Bible. And I'll tell you right now, I meet people that are confused on Bible prophecy. If they get this one issue straight, this is 90% of the battle. If, if they're struggling with prophecy and how to put it all together, and they're struggling with how the church fits into it, and they're struggling with the tribulation, all they have to do is see the truth that God is returning to the people and nation of Israel to restore them, to gather them. Well, first to bring them through the fire, right? And then to take those purged peoples and give them all of their promises. So there is a pre-tribulation rapture coming. And I'm longing for that day. I bet most of you are longing for that day. I'm telling you what, when I look at what's going on in this world, I find myself shaking my head. I foresaw some of the moral problems coming down the pipeline. But there's some of the stuff that we've seen the last two or three, three years. I did not see this stuff coming. Who would have thought that you, standing your own ground... For medical things was going to be part of your testimony where I have a right to say what goes into my body and what doesn't go into my body I have a right for to say this operation is not going to happen and, and this one I will take we're, we're, we have rights who would have thought that dairy and eating red meat was going to be an issue in the last days I've got no interest in going to algae goo and cricket. <laughs> it's just no interest whatsoever. Uh, a McChicken burger uh, for lunch one day and a McCricket burger for lunch the next day does not make sense to me. But we've got a glorious battle in front of us, folks. We don't know whether we're going to be down here for another two days, another two weeks, another two years. God forbid another decade. But however long we're down here, we have a testimony to bear. The testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel that he is the only way of salvation, the testimony that we are not to be conformed to the world, that we are to live different. The testimony that judgment is coming on this world. And that the only hope of escape is not a religion, it's not a church, it's not an experience, it's a person. His name is Jesus. And glory, some glorious day, folks, the biggest argument we're ever going to have anymore is whether coffee or tea is better. Some glorious day, there's going to be one political party on this planet, and his name is Jesus. There's going to be one religion on this planet with one denomination on this planet. And we are all going to be on the same page on everything, every jot and tittle. His name is Jesus. So keep looking up. Keep pressing onwards. And your eyes wide open, brain engaged, heart on fire. We'll see you next time.